Hi everyone, this is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 55, Going After the Unattainable. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Hi everyone, so happy new year, it's 2016, I'm so psyched to be back. I just want to mention that uh, next episode we'll be diving back into interviews, I've got some really awesome interviews with some really amazing artists as well as studios, I'm going to be interviewing people from like Blizzard Cinematics, uh, from Microsoft uh, 343, from Tippet, ILM, Pixar, I've got some really cool stuff coming up. Uh, and in addition to that, the mentorship should be as of the day that this is coming out will be open. So if you want to be a part of that, if you want to join the mentorship, this will be a chance for me to work directly with you. Uh, I've created something like 700 hours of training content for this thing. Uh, I've literally spent the entire year. I'm still building content for this and working with everyone. We've got a career intensive coming up, like a private one. We've got our own private forum, Facebook group, chat rooms. Uh, you know, basically we fully immerse ourselves within this thing where I've actually got to meet a lot of people from the mentorship. I do uh, reviews every two weeks where I'll review your work. We do it as a group and lots of other like live opportunities, a lot of other things that no one else gets access to. And I will work closely with you and, um, you know, get to mentor you over an entire year. So this is something that a lot of people have done in their spare time, whether they're working on like really big feature film movies or they're still trying to break into the industry. So, you know, no matter what kind of time um, scale you have, you know, everyone's been able to kind of make it work for them. So it's been really awesome. I'm really psyched about it. I've only allowed people to get in twice. And even this week, I've gotten people like emailing me like, hey, I missed out last time. You know, please kind of get in before you open up registration because uh, I don't want to miss out again. So if this is something you want to be a part of, uh, I'm not going to announce it publicly because, uh, you know, it fills up usually within a few days. So if this is something you want to be a, a part of, I've actually got a really cool video series that uh, I'll be releasing this week. It's eight hours of free training, and uh, this will be a chance for you to check that out. But at the same time, everyone who uh, checks out that training, I'm going to be emailing you guys with um, specific instructions or information on uh, where to sign up if it's something that you wanted to do. So if you want to check it out, go to www.alanmckay.com slash 55 download and that will um, be where you can access the videos and also uh, find out more information about the mentorship. So other than that, show notes, go to www.alanmckay.com slash 55 for the show notes, but for the, the videos and everything else, it's a free gift to you guys. Eight hours, I put it together over a big chunk of time. It's really cool on destruction, fume effects for, you know, a lot of other cool stuff. That is going to be at www.almacay.com slash 55 download. Okay, so that's it. Like I said, some really cool interviews coming up. Uh, finally, I'm just going to say that this episode, I'm doing something a bit different. I've never done this before, but rather than doing uh, a lot of solo material, I wanted to actually read an article which I wrote a while back called Going After the Unattainable. And I've gotten so much feedback about this article and it was basically something where I want to kind of open up and give a lot of insight into a lot of failure I had as well as a lot of self-doubt and just a bit of kind of an overview of like my, my career path leading to where I am today. So this is something I want to kind of read out and share with people who may not have read the article and I wanted to read this out as an episode. So I'm not sure if this is something that you guys are going to like or whether you're going to hate it, but I would love to get your feedback. So if you want, shoot me an email and tell me I suck if uh, if that's the case. Um, but yeah, I hope this is something that really benefits you and I uh, hope you enjoy it. So I have written dozens of articles as well as con contributions to books. Uh, I've done a lot over my career, but I consider myself only really having written about three articles that were ones that I wrote for me and I wrote for people within the industry, you know, and for me, it means that if I'm going to write something, I really want to put my heart and soul into it. But more importantly, it meant that there was a reason to write it. And I haven't actually read this article since I wrote it, but for me, it was very personal, but 
It was also something that I wrote for a few select people very close to me and just kind of seeing what they were all going through. And one thing that kind of inspired me has always kind of motivated me out of those three articles that I wrote. Two were about productivity and about getting more done, basically. But um, they both received a huge, huge reception. And what was really inspiring to me was getting to see a lot of change in the in, in the sorry industry uh, based on people reading these articles and, and what happened after that. So I saw a lot of studios start to change. I had a lot of meetings with a lot of bigger studio owners and overall, just getting emailed about the, the the stories and actually seeing it firsthand is really quite amazing. And with this article, when I wrote it, I wanted to do it in a way that it was essentially themed around a few things, which I will get into afterwards because I'm going to read through it myself. And I kind of thought it would be really great to do this intro before I kind of read it again. And then after I record it all, where I read it, and then I also, I guess, regurgitate it all. And um, just kind of like more of my views on it all now sometimes going on it's been about two years and just more kind of my my views on everything that i'm talking about but i will just say from memory the the main reasons i wrote it were because i get that myself and a lot of people i work with we've all done pretty well in our career you know we're at a point where we get to pick our projects we rarely get into situations which we don't have that control over and you know we've had a pretty successful path but I want to make it clear to everyone that it's not like from day one, I, I decided, okay, I'm going to go do 3D and film and everything. And it was a smooth ride. Um, there were plenty of times where, um, you know, I was trying to build a reel and get my foot in the door and getting constant rejection. Even after I got my first couple of gigs, um, there was a good year, but where I was just completely quiet. And like, I felt like I could do all the work. And I, I felt like if I could just get that one chance, you know, I could show everyone that, look, I can do all this stuff, but getting someone to give me that one chance was the hardest thing in the world. And there were plenty of times where I gave myself, you know, a time, like a bit of time. And I have an episode coming up with Ash Thorpe, who is an amazing designer. And just basically, you know, it's really uncanny how we can kind of relate to so many of the same things. And that was something he went through, which was giving himself six months to build a reel or six months to to really make an impact on his career and um i can relate to all that too where i would give myself you know three months or six months and be like okay if i don't get a job within this amount of time i should just give up and try something else you know i was always trying to be a realist about it all and i was always second guessing myself thinking maybe this isn't right for me and you know i always feel like those breaking points that we're going to give up and we're going to um you know throw in the towel. Those are the points that if you push forward, you're probably going to make that success. And for those who give up, you will never know what could have happened. And I have so many of those in my career where I could have given up and I could have just tried something easier or just within not even giving up, just deciding to go the easy path, the safe path, rather than getting out of my comfort zone. I could have had a moderately happy career doing fun stuff, or I could take those risks and really push forward. And, you know, every time that I've met other people, uh, even last year, I would talk about this and we would all kind of be able to identify that, that one moment or those multiple times where we can relate to, we could have said yes, or we could have said no, and it would have made a world of difference in our lives. And we were the ones who always said yes. And we can look back and identify that one decision being the thing that changed our lives, our careers, everything. And for me, that is something that I really want to ingrain in a lot of you is that I have had many of those experiences. I've had many times wanting to give up. And I've also had many people telling me to give up. And I could have. And I always wonder about that. I always look back and wonder where I'd be now if that had happened. You know, I always look at my career not being like, you know, work is everything, but more it's given me the freedom and allowed me to do pretty much anything that I want. You know, I'm able to make those decisions like, hey, I'm going to go and work in this country or I'm going to go do this or I really need to take time off. But because I've worked hard and I've done all these things, I can do that or I can change careers slightly and it has allowed me to do that. This career that I've built for myself has given me the keys to allow me to do whatever I want to do. And I think that we all can have that. Just a lot of us really kind of think very narrow minded. And I think it's more about really using this as a vehicle to do whatever to actually do whatever we want to do. So the other reason I wrote it was for my girlfriend who had someone 
her father who would always kind of tell her to to get a real job to think realistically and not to to you know do that art stuff you know it's a waste of time and just to give up okay and i think that we've all had those people and i think it's it's even worse when it's um a parent you know a a leader or some kind of figure in your life that you look up to who is telling you that whatever you're doing is a waste of time and you should just give up now and do something real and for her like at one point she actually joined the air force because that was what would make her her dad happy and for me i look back another portion of this is that uh my mom who i love the death um at times this can actually be a negative thing but she's never been someone to tell me that i could never do anything she's always been like you can do whatever you want and i like to at least think of that as something that even sometimes as unrealistic as it was it meant i never had anyone telling me no you cannot do this So I meant sometimes what might really be unrealistic or unattainable because I didn't have that that uh mental mind state of someone saying no 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 I was able to actually go out there and do it and I always think that I'm a pretty good problem solver I think that that's probably one of my uh better assets or skill sets is I've always been good at problem solving and I like to think that with my career I applied that by being able to identify things that might seem really unattainable and then figure out this like really creative way to actually go about and get it done. And I think that those two together allowed me to do a lot. Whereas if I had someone telling me no you can't do it, uh it would change everything. And I have had so many of those people, you know, who would basically say you can't do it, give up. And if I had listened to them, you know, every single time I can point out like all these things that would have just crippled me in terms of where I could be or where what I could do. And The worst part is that even if it is an outside influences, we all have that inside of us, our inner critic or how if you want to identify it, but some some part of us is trying to bring us back down and that's when I say, you know, to get out of your comfort zone, a lot of us kind of face that point where that one part of us wants to say, look, if you go and do the safe route, you know, everything's going to be great, but if you try and do change, change is bad. You should play it safe and just do what you're comfortable with. Do what you've done before. you know and i use analogies like going up to a girl or a guy uh because those are the types of things that every part of you is going to start freaking out and like making you want to back down so i think those are really great analogies if you were to go up to a complete stranger and face a chance of rejection you know that is a great example where as soon as you try and do it every part of you is just being like hold on turn around you're going to get rejected you're going to look like a fool all these fears start popping into your head and if you start to go out there and um and try and do that with your job or anything else again all of these fears start to pop up what if you lose your job what if you fail what if no one ever hires you again what if people laugh at you what if everyone looks at you as a failure what if you look at yourself as a failure all of these things start to pop up and it can be so crippling and it isn't a temporary thing going up to someone and getting rejected may affect you long term but you know most healthy people it's going to be a short term thing for me i'm going to laugh at it if someone says no i'm going to be like okay well you know they're lost i'm going to go on about my day and i'm going to keep having a great night whatever it's going to be uh but that that's just it like you can allow it to affect you or you can internalize and learn from it and that's usually how i look at failure these days is I'll still maybe necessarily will look at it as failure but I'll look at it as a learning experience even if it was going up to someone and saying hi and they say no well maybe I could have done that better maybe I could have smiled more maybe they're having a bad day whatever the situation might be but I'm never going to look at it like you're so stupid what are you doing you know give up <laughs> whatever it's going to be anyway um that sort of thing is just I I see it all the time and I would see it in a lot of people around me that they would have all this great opportunity but instead outside things interfered or they were too afraid and I've had actually so many of these uh conversations recently where I've wanted to collaborate with some friends and I've said you know why don't we do this or you've got so much potential I'd love to get behind you and really help you you know achieve that thing that you want to do if you want to go direct or whatever I'll freaking go out and hold a camera <laughs> you just do what if you do like whatever is so important to you I would love to be there for you and it's usually those those points where they actually have everything that they could actually go out there and do it that they have that moment of what if where that inner critic or what have you want to refer to it but that that part of you that tells you no okay um one of my friends he's a, a chef a really great chef he was a supervising chef for the commonwealth games one year in melbourne and he wanted to open his own restaurant and i had a lot of money 
lying around at that time. And yeah, he wanted to open a restaurant and his girlfriend and I, and he were at dinner one night and he was telling me how that's his ultimate dream that he wanted to do that. And I remember saying to him, it was, it was one of my best friends from high school. And I said to him, like, look, how much do you need to get that started? And he told me how much it would be. And it was, it was a lot of money. But I remember saying to him, like, look, I've got this money. I've just finished working, you know, this horrendous year. And I know me. And right now, like, I'll, I will go and find some stupid way to spend that. I would rather invest it in something that's worthwhile. So I said to him, I've got the money. If you really want to do this, if this is something that is your passion, your dream, the thing that you really want to do, then I'm behind it. I will gladly give you this money this week if you want to go out there and make it happen. And his girlfriend was so excited and I could see the fear in his face. It was, com it was literally the complete opposite. It was basically this moment where I think all of us have that. It's called imposter syndrome where we start to think, what if I'm a fraud? What if... Uh, people are going to judge me, you know, all these kind of inner fears that start to show up. And that's exactly what happened where I was happy to to give him what he needed. The thing that he was like, oh, if I, if I ever had the money, I would go and do this. This is what I've always dreamt of doing. It would be so amazing. And to actually be given the keys to do that, you suddenly get that uh, being faced with reality. And it's so easy for you then to be like, okay, like all these doubts, all these fears will start to brew up. And it's a lot easier for you to kind of like shrink back in your chair and start to go to your comfort zone, you know, go back to uh, to what you feel is safe. In other words, being an employee and working and all the things that you know, rather than saying yes and going after the thing you're so passionate about. You know, people always say like the grass is greener, you know, you you always kind of picture life out there, you know, being so much more amazing and perfect. But a lot of us, if we we're faced with the opportunity to go out and, and live that, a lot of us do have that like, no, it's, it's, it's nice and warm in here. I'm, I'm too scared. What if, you know, things happen? What if the bad things happen out there? So in this case, like, what if uh, I'm a failure? What if I lose this money or, or whatever it's going to be? So that to me, I've seen it so many times and it blows my mind to watch that happen. And at the same time, I've gone through that too. Like we all have. And so this article for me, there were so many different reasons I wrote it. One, like I said, was just to more point out to everyone, look, I've gone through so many times in my life where I completely doubted myself. Um, I've also have gone through failure, you know, um, you know, we all have that. And also there's other people around who have those people kind of, you know, whispering in their ear, you're going to fail, you're nothing, you're, you're a fraud, whatever it's going to be. And for me, it was more about just going out and doing it and not really looking back, taking risks, planning ahead. So I'll just say that when I wrote this, I shared it with some of my friends and I wasn't quite sure what to expect. Um, I will just say for me, like it was a very, you know, I've never entered something for so long, but like it was a big deal for me to write it. And I kind of wrote it in a way to say thank you to my mom. Like I owe everything to her just for the fact that she never said, um, you know, no, you can't do this or maybe you should aim a little lower, you know. And uh, the funny thing is I actually shared it with her and uh, I told her like, you know, why I wrote it and everything. And <laughs> she actually responded with, um, you know, there's a couple of spelling mistakes in there and started to pick it apart. So, you know, it's kind of f funny, I guess, to uh, not really the, the reception I was expecting. But um, at the same time, like I showed it with some, showed it some other people who know me and know all the things I've been through. And, you know, a lot of these guys and girls are, you know, doing stuff in the industry and have been in it for a long time. And, it's weird. I never expected it, but like every single person like, told me that they were in tears at the end of it. And maybe it's just because they know me. Um, they can relate a bit more. But um, I just found like the more people who got into it, the more it was um, just, you know, uh, one person I think referred to as like a big, fresh cup of coffee. And I, I personally, I love stories where you, you know, people can kind of deconstruct a lot of what helped them along the way. And also, you know, just hearing people and like some of the great things they've done. So like the last thing I'll say is that for me, like I think that there's a, a few different personality types out there. And when I go to, let's say a party or something and uh, I meet, you know, someone who's doing all this amazing stuff that I one day want to do, you know, I think that there are people out there who instantly get kind of offended and, you know, maybe they don't even realize they're doing it, but they start to you know, be like, oh, I hate that guy or I hate that girl. Like what a, what a fake, you know, they're all up themselves and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, just for them, it's, it's kind of like, um, 
this weird mindset that they go through where maybe they'll start telling them like, oh, that's nothing. I'm better than you. Like this, the extremes of what you can think of. And for me, like I want to surround myself with people who are better than me, who are doing more amazing things. Like to me, it's so inspiring. Like I'll meet people, whether they're in my industry or other industries and they're doing so much great stuff. And for me, like hearing about their story or hearing about the cool things they're doing, it just inspires me. It's just like, wow, like it's not about, I want to be better than them. It's more like, I just want to be around these people because it's just so amazing and, and so great to, to, uh, to hear that and see that. So I don't know. I think for some people, um, it can be just really motivating to kind of have that insight. Anyway, I'm going to get started now, but, um, yeah, like I said, I, I wanted to give a bit of a, uh, a full word to it all and just explain like, you know, again, where I'm at now and uh, why I put this together. And I don't know, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well as how I'm doing with reading. I've, I've heard some audiobooks written by authors and I'm like, man, you are not, you know, not the right person for reading this stuff. Hire a pro. So I'd love any feedback, you know, tell me I'm terrible. <laughs> I would love to know. Awesome. Well, let's get started with this. So I'll just quickly also add in where and when I wrote this. So I actually wrote this in my hotel room in Boston. Uh, I think it was November 2013. So it was the very end of the year. I was out there for a couple of weeks. We we're just wrapping up on Denzel's movie, The Equalizer. And I think I wrote this in about two days, just in the morning before I'd, I'd head out and uh, get on with the film. And a lot of it, I would just say that I wrote once. Like I intentionally wrote it with the intent, especially the end of it, without ever wanting to go back and change it. Just purely just pour my heart and soul into it. And um, yeah, hopefully that kind of transfers over as well. Okay. I've been hesitant to publish this on many levels, and even writing it in a lot of ways has been difficult to look back at everything. My intent for this article is not to make my life story, but more to point out certain pivotal moments that changed my life and trickle in key bits of advice that can be applied to anyone's career. Also, to demonstrate times of failure, self-doubt, and pushing it through to success. My intention is not to make this article braggy or look at me now. More, I hope it inspires some of you who are at the tipping point of wondering if they should keep doing what they love or if they should just give up. Even recently, I've met people who are in the industry but haven't quite made it and are questioning themselves. I've been asked so many of these types of questions recently and also seen people close to me giving up on their dreams because of self-doubt or doubt of their friends or family. This just seemed like the right time to write this. I have nervously shown this to a select few people within the industry that I look up to who have all responded so unexpectedly with how it affected them and inspired and made them or how they could relate. They finally gave me the bravery to actually post this. Mastering anything doesn't come overnight. We all reach our tipping point where we can begin to doubt ourselves. The ones that push forward are the ones that make it. Nothing worth having is easily obtained. That's the end of my foreword and the article begins going after the unattainable. February 1996, grade 9, high school, second weekend, fed up, I quit, cold turkey. I'd barely gone to school up until that point, so this was nothing new. But when I finally made that realization that I wasn't actually going back, I realized I'd better make something of myself. I grew up in a small town in Australia with a population of roughly 8,000 people. I'd seen my fair share of people dropping out of high school while growing up and the types of jobs and career they had or the careers they didn't really actually have. This scared the crap out of me. Even that young, I knew I needed to take action and I needed to do something with my life. Age seven, I wanted to be a writer. Age five, I wanted to be a ninja. Age three, a T-Rex. Age 11, it finally stuck. I wanted to work in Hollywood in the USA creating effects for blockbuster films. This was the ultimate creative outlet blowing things up, making dinosaurs come to life, creating the impossible. For most, I probably had more of a chance of being a T-Rex or a ninja. Back then, I was inspired by Terminator 2, Jurassic Park, and dozens of other films that started to come out at the time, mostly all from this one studio, Industrial Light and Magic, or ILM, but this is where I really felt I was destined to be. But with no education, no money, my mom and I lived in a 300 square foot apartment in pretty much Nowhereville, Australia, literally the other side of the planet, on a continent more recognized for wrestling crocodiles and vicious baby-eating dingoes than anything else. Before the internet had arrived to make the world such a small place that it is today, a 13-year-old dropout, to dream of working with the best of the best in Hollywood, California, I might as well have decided to be an astronaut. Growing up, I always loved art. I loved drawing, sculpting, pastels, 
Hell, I used to draw up designs for He-Man and G.I. Joe toys for my mom to send off to Mattel so I could make my millions when I was four years old. So although my mom and I never had money at all, I was always the poor kid that never really wanted to leave my friend's houses because they had so many toys to play with. I did have a lot of confidence and a lot of ambition. I would always sell my artwork to strangers and pester my mom's friends to buy my sketches, which were all mainly comic book characters, drawings of Deadpool, Spider-Man, Batman, and various other hooded, ripped badasses. I had a knack for doing a lot with the little I had. I'd set up multiple garage sales on the side of the road to sell pretty much anything I owned when I was desperate. Or if I had my mind set on buying something, at age 8 for instance, I wanted to buy... Man, I love reading this stuff out. I would buy dirty magazines and rent them out to older kids at school at a per night rate for almost the same price as I was buying them for. And of course, in quotes, not my proudest moment. But I learned very early on the valuable lesson that if I wanted something, I need to go out there and get it for myself. No handouts, no unrealistic expectations, just determination and taking the initiative. I was resourceful and focused, so selling my art offered me a chance to put enough money together to buy an old secondhand 286 PC for $300. With one meg of RAM, an 8-bit graphics card, a grand 256 colors, a mouse and an assortment of paint and animation programs, all I could fit on a 40 meg hard drive, now I could play video games finally. But I found something that instantly I knew was my future. I don't know how or even what I could actually put this to use to, but my obsession with multimedia had stuck with me ever since playing my first video game or seeing any FMV or full motion video or any of the now laughable graphics that I was in awe of back then. I wanted to make art on the computer. Soon I had deluxe paint animation, Animator Pro and a lot of TSR or Terminate and Stay Resident, a technical term for utilities that linger in your memory after you close them, allowing you the luxury of ghetto multitasking in MS-DOS. I'll just improvise here and just say that um, I would pretty much use screen capture programs to capture a lot of the video game art, um, let's say in a video game that I could actually then use by capturing all the frames to paint over and create my own characters. So, you know, not having the resources to film anything or anything like that, it allowed me to kind of have an environment to work on, which was uh, a creative but more um, crazy way of going about doing this stuff. But it, it allowed me to have something to initially start with, like backgrounds and cool stuff that I could then paint my own characters and design them pixel by pixel, frame by frame into uh, those animations. So I then had a place to then start to paint in my own animations and make my own movies. This was the beginning for me. We all have those key moments in our lives, those big sliding doors moments that we can pinpoint where something big had happened that changed everything. A family member passing, your first kiss or your first trip to Tijuana with a group of people you only just met. Or in the case when I was 11, my mom came home from buying the groceries on a whim, had bought me a gift of an issue of Design Graphics magazine for me to read. It was so random that she had done that, but as I flicked through the magazine, each page turn brought me closer to discovering something that single-handedly changed my life forever. There were two things that stood out. One was some of the advertisements for Wavefront, a 3D program on the SGI, pretty famous for the TV show Reboot, which was one of the first computer animated TV series to ever come out. SGIs, something I knew nothing about, other than to me then being supercomputers that usually are responsible for making all that CGI stuff. The other was a review of 3D Studio R3 for DOS but I couldn't make sense of what exactly I was looking at. All I knew was that I couldn't paint these ever so clean, lit, smooth surface images like in the magazine. It was so far beyond what I could paint or draw on a computer. I don't know how they did it, but it felt so clean and real, but again, out of my reach. The review of 3DS R3, however, did stick in my mind. They talked so in depth about it, and in a way I knew this software, if I could get my hands on it, was the key. I felt so pulled to this thing, whatever the hell it was, I wanted to be able to make imagery like this. Two years went by and I was still obsessing about computer art. I had started to take my interests and find ways to apply them, going on BBSs or bulletin board systems, kind of like the internet before the internet, or buying various PC video game magazines that had the attached three and a half inch floppy disks that came filled with various utilities that would allow me to modify video games such as Wolfenstein 3D or Doom. This was huge for me. I could suddenly paint again, frame by glorious frame, characters in motion, and insert the .pcx images into the game and have it read them, and see the monsters I created come to life within the game. Customize maps, develop my own world inside of the game engine. My 286 couldn't handle Doom, yet I was obsessing over that game now, and I started to recreate my own art of Doom inside of Wolfenstein. 
my own characters, my own imagery. I would stay up to all hours of the night building my worlds and thinking of creative things to do. This was definitely my future. I could taste it. Shortly after I quit school, I had now managed to replace all the parts inside of my 286 within a 486DX4, 100 megahertz, 4 meg of glorious RAM. Finally, I could play Doom. Through an odd twist of events, I also managed to get 3 Studio R4 for DOS. 14 floppy disks later, in about 2 hours of installing, I was ready to rock and roll. With a not too legitimate copy of the program that my mother's friend's friend, who was in architecture, briefly came over and installed for me, he showed me how to build a cube, make it glass, add a light, and render it in a couple of minutes, and then disappeared out of my life. This is where my obsession began. I hid away and disappeared from family and peers, I made friends with caffeine, and I set out to master the software. The only time I had for sleep was whatever amount of hours remaining was listed in my render dialogue. At 6 in the morning, if it said my render would take 5 hours, I would set my alarm and I'd be back at 11am. This was my moment. I knew what I wanted to do. I had a goal. I knew where I wanted to be. Sure, I might have been 14, but I was determined to succeed at all costs. To follow my passion, I wasn't going to let anything stop me. Over my career, I've mentored and helped many talented artists with their careers. I've helped artists just starting out in 3D, all the way through to giving workshops and talks at Ubisoft and ILM. I've spoken in front of crowds as large as 3,000 people in a single room, many countries all around the world. At this stage, I've done a lot. And this is a common subject that comes up. How did I start my career? Or where did I go to school? How did I get into this? More recently, it's become a pretty common question. How did you get that big break? That job that changed everything? And were there any pitfalls along the way? or people who doubted you or tried to persuade you to quit. First, how I started out. I still remember the day I sat down with a piece of paper and did something that I think is solely responsible for where I am today. It made me able to get such an unattainable dream and break it down into digestible steps that I could do one step at a time. I sat down with a sheet of paper and at the very top, I wrote my absolute dream goal, doing CGI in Hollywood. My goal from the little I could find on the subject that wasn't really that mainstream back then. I wanted most likely to end up as a technical director, which described to me was halfway between a creative role and a programming role, requiring a lot of problem solving. Ultimately, thinking long, long pipe dream goal was to become a visual effects supervisor. That seemed to be the job the top guys who you would see at Industrial Light and Magic, Digital Domain, PDI, and the others on all the documentaries about CGI seem to all have. So that sounded like the be all and end all of visual effects. At the bottom of that piece of paper, I marked with an X, which pretty much stood for you are here. I logically wrote down the roadblocks that I thought I would have. I don't have an education on paper. I don't have any experience. I don't have a portfolio. I don't know others in the industry. I wrote them all in the middle of the paper and then I began to break down each step. Okay, so how do I get this education or piece of paper? How do I get that experience? How do I find others in the industry? Again, before the internet. How would I achieve each of these steps? Some of them would need me to fulfill a different step prior to that step. Each of these seemed like completely different tasks. And I soon had over a dozen steps or mini goals I had to do to tackle each of these things. It was going to be a lot of work, but I had a goal, I had a direction, and I had something now to focus on. The next step was a timeline. I thought Hollywood was still a pipe dream and I would need to prove myself 10 times over before I could ever get there. So there were more steps to break down between my end goal and the point where I had achieved all the core requirements I had set out. So I needed to break down a career path. Once I had achieved all of these midway markers, I had stepping stones from there to getting to that goal. At least those would be more linear. I aimed to work in video games and eventually work my way into TV and film over time. I still look back on this sheet of paper as a magic bullet, an instructional guide on how to reach the ultimate goal of working in Hollywood. And I'm still convinced that most people who set out to do what they want to do never get there because they simply have had a goal they thought was too overwhelming and no clear guidelines to follow. They either didn't push themselves hard enough or weren't willing to take the leap of faith to go after what was really important in their life. Do you want to drag yourself out of bed every morning to go to the job you hate and try and find hobbies in your spare time to get a little bit of satisfaction in your life? Or do you want to find the thing that you love most and push yourself to become better and better at it while making a living off of your enjoyment? Most just don't think it's possible and take the easy route. 
rather than spending that little bit of time in the beginning to sit down and figure out, okay, how the heck am I going to do this? And then commit themselves to working their asses off, no matter what the cost to get there. Who here likes a challenge? I will just add that I, I strongly believe that if you're not willing to put in the hard work in the beginning of your career, and you just want to take it easy in the beginning, then you're going to be working really hard the rest of your career, the rest of your life, rather than putting in the time now, getting out of your comfort zone and really going at it and setting yourself up so that way it's easy street for the rest of your life. But one way or another, it's going to happen. It's just, would you rather be working crazy hours and putting in all the stress and pressure um, down the line? Or would you rather do it now and set yourself up so that way you have that freedom and that life set up down the line to do whatever you want to do? So I just wanted to add that in just as a challenge to you. And hopefully it makes sense that you take action now and you make the most you can. Otherwise, you will be doing it for the rest of your life rather than setting up yourself up for easy street later on. Now back to the story. Sorry, I'm in a bit of a goofy mood tonight. For me, nothing was going to stop me. I had a goal now and I honestly felt like I was ready to die for this goal. I had a purpose and I was willing to move forward. I was hungry. I was excited and I had a drive to succeed like I had never experienced before. This subject was very unheard of where I was from. Nobody seemed to know what 3D animation or CGI was back then. Even the term visual effects was still kind of forming as a differentiator for special effects, which was the practical side. So special effects being, uh, you know, makeup or live explosions, squibs, you know, anything like that where it's actually being filmed on set. One of my goals was still to try and find others interested in the subject of 3D and visual effects. Again, without any internet yet around that time, I moved to a fairly small city, Brisbane, with my mom. I enrolled at a college briefly, purely to gain access to some of their unattainable resources I needed. It was a bit of work to get in because I was so young. I was like 14. A lot of phone calls and mailing in all of my work, trying to prove I was serious about all of this. The main reason I enrolled was to use their labs. They had fast computers and they also had 3D Studio Max 1. The other reason was the network. To meet others in the industry, I found this to be great. It was motivating to have others around who are all doing great things. And again, I just want to add that in. For me, probably the greatest experience out of that very short amount of time I had was actually probably the networking aspect of it. And I have mixed feelings about uh, colleges and going and spending like $40,000 a year to, uh, to study, you know, 3d and things like that. But I do feel like one of the really great things you do get from it is the fact that you do get to meet other students, you know, like, and network and build those friendships. So I think that having other people around you, especially for some of us, it's really rewarding. So I wanted to add that in because I do think that that's definitely a really valuable thing. And that's what I got from that small portion of time where I did go to a college just to hang out in the lab, but I got to build uh, friends with people who up until that point, I'd never met anyone who even knew what 3D was, let alone other people doing it. I made a lot of friends through the labs, mainly young adults in their 20s and 30s who were all eager to get into this new 3D fad or other areas of multimedia. So this seems like a logical step for me. I would practically live at the lab morning through until late at night. I had made lots of friends, but there were also just as many other personalities I would come across who seemed to almost look at the world and everyone else in it with a lot of negativity and almost breathed negativity and discouraged the same way they would breathe air. If your work showed promise and others accepted you, you were a target for ridicule by these people. Almost as if to overcome their own insecurities, they needed to pull other peers' morale down. In addition, I had instructors or lab assistants and other more authority and influential people who were all there to encourage you, filling me with self-doubt. You'll never make it. You're too young. Nobody will hire you. You should just give up. There's no real work out there for this sort of thing. At the same time, I had friends doing the same thing back home. They were all in school, and for them, life was about chasing girls and underage drinking, hanging out at the mall. I was in a whole other world than all these other people. I wasn't willing to let people bring me down and tell me that I can't do something. It made me furious. I felt like nobody saw the world how I saw it. I wanted to be the best I could be. I wanted to be great. I didn't want to be told I'm destined to fail. You'll never make it in video games. That's all done in America. You're dreaming. You should pick a different career. I think this is something everyone can relate to, whether it's your parents, your friends, your colleagues. It's people usually that just don't understand and they don't understand it. And of course, then they can't relate. Therefore, it's stupid, 
pointless or a waste of time. There's people who project their own doubts in, in themselves onto others. If they feel they can't achieve their goals, if they can't be excited about something, they push that onto you, whether they're even aware that they're doing it or not. There's always my favorite, something I never understood, jealousy. To this, I can never understand how someone can witness someone doing great things and want to tear them down. I purposely welcome people greater than me into my life. I hungrily surround myself with people that are better than me, more talented, more successful. It inspires me. It makes me want to do better things. I feed off of that. I will never, ever understand why someone must tell someone else they aren't any good just to make themselves feel better. Australia especially has a term called tall poppy syndrome, which to quote Wikipedia, tall poppy syndrome or TPS is a pejorative term primarily used in the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and other Anglosphere nations to describe a social phenomenon in which people of genuine merit are resented, attacked, cut down, or criticized because of their talents or achievements elevate them above or distinguish them from their peers. At the time, however, there was only two studios doing minor 3D work in my area. No video games or other mediums. Maybe everybody was right. There wasn't really a career out there for doing this sort of stuff. And then it happened. In 1996, a game company called Oren partnered with Activision and announced a AAA game being developed right here in Brisbane. This was my big break. I found out there was a big event for the game's launch coming up. They were showcasing the game Dark Rain and also played the amazing pre-rendered cinematic for it on the big screen, one of the earliest works from the newly formed Blur Studio in Los Angeles. I attended the launch because I knew the developers were going to be there. I needed to talk to them. I had been working on my reel and my whole motivation at that point was getting a job there. But everyone around me was filling me with doubt and telling me nobody is going to hire a kid. The CEO, Greg Lane, was there, and after his big unveiling, I approached him from the side and asked him one single question outright, directly eye to eye. I needed to know for my own sanity. Do you have an age limit on hiring your artists? If they're good and under 18, will you hire them? Lane's response, if you're good, you're good, we'll hire you. I darted out of that convention center so fast, I literally ran, walked, and ran with so much new determination straight home to my computer and began working harder than ever on my first demo reel a video compilation of all of my work. I thought it was the time to try and venture out into the world. I was hungry for this. Nothing else mattered. I was going to get that job there. I had to. I cut my reel and I output it out of the college lab onto a VHS tape. I mailed it in and waited and waited. I called and they had received it. I waited more and finally making a few connections there through friends on IRC, which is Internet Relay Chat. And yes, finally the internet had arrived. I managed to get a response from the head of 3D. They liked my work, but I wasn't quite there yet. This is where I could have given up, but I saw it as obviously I need to get better. I need to work harder. I need to work longer hours. People now had proof I wasn't good enough. I couldn't deal with the I told you so's echoing through my head. So I spent another six months and I cut a new reel and I sent it in. This was the absolute best work I'd ever made. I was so proud and I knew that this was it. I felt like I had practically had the job the minute the CD was mailed out to them. Again, rejection. I felt like a failure. At this stage, I was broken. I felt like giving up. I felt like everyone was right. I just wasted my life. I was still barely about to turn 15, but emotionally I was exhausted. I had given it everything I had, and despite everyone telling me I couldn't do it, I wanted to prove each and every one of them that they were wrong. And now I just felt silly, like of course they were right. Who am I to think I'd actually make it and do something? and have actually achieved something I set out for. I decided to give it one last shot. But if I was going to do this, I needed to start from scratch. I needed to take everything I knew and plan everything out. I needed to look at my work as if I was the one hiring me. Everything they could pick apart about my work. What were my weaknesses? There wasn't room for any doubt. I needed to showcase characters, hard surface modeling, texturing abilities, shading abilities, lighting, animation, effects. I had learned so much from being so curious over the years, I'd gotten really good in these areas. And I'd also gotten a very strong grasp on integrating live action footage or photos with CG. Not something too relative to games, but for movies, my end goal, this is something I needed to be good at. I felt like applying at Oren, again, would be a handicap. This is going to be my last try and I wanted a fresh chance to fail. I sent my work out to two separate video game companies. Both came back to me with job offers, Suddenly I was having multiple job offers, what the fuck? Within no time I was signed up working on Half-Life. 
it was six months of remote work, modeling and texturing and animating in 3ds Max, and I felt like my career was finally happening. It felt like I wasn't crazy, I wasn't a failure, I wasn't a kid that nobody would hire. Half-Life was on my fucking resume. Again, I'm just going to add this part in rather than reading what I had written. But basically from there, what most would expect is like, this is your in. This is where I've finally made it, my foot's in the door, it's all great from here. And the thing is that I went from working on, I'm assuming it was probably like the number one game for 96 or 97, whenever it came out. Uh, it was a massive title at the time. And I would have imagined from there, it's like everyone's going to be knocking on your door, like beating it down to, to hire you. And I went through a year after that where I got a few jobs here and there, but it wasn't like I was now this person everyone was like hiring or, or willing to hire. Um, so, you know, I got a few gigs here and there, small things, but I basically went like a full year where I was pretty much almost back to square one. So even after having that moment of like, yes, I did it, that didn't necessarily mean that I, I'd made it. Okay. And I think that's important too. It's, it's not always going to be like, all right, like you got that dream job, you worked in Avatar, and everyone's going to hire you for the rest of your life. You've got to still be, uh, you know, in the trenches trying to get that work. And me being in Australia, I didn't really, I hadn't really made it yet. Like I was still, Australia is a very small place. The industry hadn't really grown enough yet. Now it's much bigger, but at the time there wasn't much work. And so, you know, I started to go through this really uninspired phase where I, I was kind of getting feeling depression and just wondering like, you know, what the hell's going on? Am I going to get that work and starting to kind of get that self doubt again? So where things changed was that through networking, in other words, uh, on Half-Life, coincidentally, I'd met one other Aussie on the project and he was working at a studio in, in uh, Sydney and kind of helping me out. He showed my latest reel to his boss and this was like a brand new reel I had just cut and this was a fresh new reel where rather than going for uh, showing like all my old stuff, which was all video game work, I decided to show a, a reel that was custom built for the type of work I want to get. So in other words, I'm not trying to get work on my merits of what I've previously done. I had that experience in my resume, but I was going to showcase what I could do for target employers in the area that I wanted to get into, which was more TV or film, that sort of thing. And I think that's really important is having that end goal of cutting a showreel that's designed to showcase what you want to do. Otherwise, people are going to only be interested in hiring you for the stuff that you've previously shown, which is for me in that case, video games. So what I say in the article is this reel didn't contain any game work. It didn't focus as much on texturing or animation, but at this point I was focused on modeling effects and compositing. I would model entire digital environments and blow them all to hell. I had ships smashing through piers or bridges, UFOs crashing through buildings, whatever new movie was coming out, I was rebuilding the, the big money shots in 3D. I was told my understanding of integrating live action with CG is something that was rare, as most people when they're starting out have zero understanding of this, and it proved I'd be able to jump right into production, which was a huge advantage. I relocated to Sydney to Ambience Design, which at the time was one of the top three biggest post-production studios in Australia. Oddly, all of them were right next door to each other, Animal Logic and Gun and McLaren Design or GMD. I still remember my first day walking up the stairs into the main hall, the odd soapy, fruity smell in the staircases of the building, the long hallway filled with rooms, each room with 3D artists or Flame or Hal or Henry Suites or the machine room. All these people all busy working on commercials, music videos. The feeling was so overwhelming. I started as a 3D artist with the emphasis on effects whenever that sort of work came in. I did talking dog commercials, modeled props, animated characters and logos. In my spare time, I lived at work, using the render farm to develop new effects, new techniques. I was trying to push the limits on what could be done at the time with effects, especially out of 3ds Max, which was very much the underdog of 3D software back then. I documented it into articles I published online. Nobody else was doing this and I had to learn everything I knew from scratch. Why not save everyone else the trouble, show the world how at least I created tornadoes, explosions, clouds, fire, whatever. My first weeks at Ambience, I learned more than I had learned in my entire career leading up to that point. That was the point I felt I'd finally arrived. I had achieved something. I was working with some of the most talented, amazing artists many of which I got to meet again earlier this year when I visited Australia. Almost each and every person at the studio at the time has individually influenced me in some way. Ambience at the time was the most life-changing experience for me. 
I was a sponge. Being around so much creative talent, I wasn't going to let that opportunity go to waste. Eventually, a friend of mine in editorial cut a new reel of my work. After having worked in TV commercials for two years, I suddenly had over 30 commercials I'd worked on. I had so much stuff that was so polished and professional. There's such a huge difference when working on productions with a team than by yourself. With a team, you have everyone teaming together to make something great. Your work instantly looks more polished. Prior to that, everyone's student reel is always going to showcase more what areas you lack rather than what you excel. I decided as a gag to send my work to LA. I sent it only to two studios, Blizzard Cinematics and Blur Studio. Both of these companies, I was a huge fan of their work. Blizzard sent back the standard HR thank you letter, your work is on file. Tim Miller, one of the founders of Blur and very much the face of Blur, and now actually the director of Deadpool, which comes out in February, emailed me directly. Words can't describe how I felt at that moment. I wish I still kept the email from nearly 15 years ago. Someone that I idolized and respected, as well as Blur Studio itself, and the work they were doing even back then, contacting me at 18, saying he loved my work and wanted to offer me a job, move out to LA and work at Blur Studio. Oh, motherfucking MG. Shortly after, it became obvious that although I seemed qualified for the job, I wouldn't qualify yet with the government for a visa to work in the United States. But Tim kept in touch with me and I continued to mail him updates, reels, and stuff like that over the next coming years and stay in touch. Since working at Ambience, I never looked back. I left Ambience to work on my first ever Hollywood film. Shortly after, I was offered work on The Matrix and on Lord of the Rings. Sadly, I agreed literally days before that to take a staff job and work on two Disney films instead, which I knew would be total flops, but I wanted to honor my contract. And I've got different opinions about that these days, but I will say that for someone to turn down Lord of the Rings and The Matrix to work on <clears throat> George of the Jungle 2 and Inspector Gadget 2, uh, yeah, it wasn't probably the smartest move of my career. I moved to Los Angeles days after I turned 21. And then I just added in, come on guys, like I was going to move there before I reached the legal drinking age in the US. I became a technical director at 19. I was a visual effects supervisor by 23. I've worked all over the world. I got to work at Blur, which was my dream come true. I got to work in Industrial Light and Magic under amazing talent such as John Knoll, Dennis Murin. I got to speak at Seagraph in front of hundreds of people, close to 10 times now. One of my greatest moments was receiving the award of Autodesk Master at Seagraph in San Diego in front of hundreds of people. And recently, I was the only person in history to be nominated for the award a second time until Autodesk realized they had already awarded me the status and pulled the nomination. Uh, I've worked with amazing directors like Michael Bay, Robert Zemeckis, Brian Singer, M. Night Shyamalan. Even through a strange turn of events, I was approached to interview for the position of art director on Doom 4 for id Software, which I felt too unworthy to consider. Last year, I actually had dinner with the art director for Doom 4, and lo and behold, they definitely found the right guy for this. I got to work with so many influential, amazing artists, some of my closest friends that I'll never say to their face, but I completely idolize. I've been blessed to work on so many amazing movies, work under such great artists, supervisors, directors, be a part of so many amazing things and travel the world doing what I love. I don't say any of this to impress you. I say all of this to leave an impression on you. It's so hard to put into words how grateful and lucky and appreciative I am to have gotten to experience everything that I have. From people telling me the whole time growing up what I can't do and that I won't go anywhere. The one person I had that told me time and time again that I can do it and told me yes when others said no is my mom. Even if she didn't quite understand, she would still say, yes, do it. That's great. Any of this is achievable and reachable. I'm no different than anybody else. And it's just a matter of surrounding yourself with the right people who align their goals with yours and to force yourself to push forward when it's easier to step back. The people that encourage us are far and few between, but their encouragement is the ones that we should listen to. They're the ones that I owe everything to. And I want to thank them for making my dreams come true. I've met so many people who have had their parents or people who do have a lot of influence on their lives doubt them and encourage them to fail and push them to the brink of wanting to give up on their dreams and their passions. Most of the time, they don't even realize they're doing it. But take a minute and think about the effects of your words are going to have on the people around you. What you have to gain from limiting others and how much of a positive effect you could have on that person by showing a little encouragement. And for everyone out there with dreams, no matter how unrealistic as you think they might be, 
Never give up and never let people tell you you can't do something. All great things take time, struggle, and hard work, but it just makes the reward when you finally get there so, so much sweeter. And I signed at Alan McKay, November 4th, 2013, Hollywood, California. And I put a picture of me standing out the front of ILM while I was working there. Obviously, this was a very personal piece that I wrote not only for myself, but also for a lot of people around me that were close to me that I cared about who had gone through similar things. And more for everyone who might have those people kind of whispering in the ear, like, give up, you know, you're nothing, you know, get a real job, all those sorts of things that I think a lot of us when we're first getting in, uh, all of us have like those people around us and we need to kind of filter them out and to really um, surround ourselves with the people that are who are really more encouraging because those are the sorts of people you want. You don't want poisonous people in your life. And I guess with everything I seem to use relationships as analogies, but you know, again, we can all pinpoint bad relationships we've had in the past. And we're like, what the hell was I thinking? And how unhealthy was that uh, for me to go through that? We never look at the negative ones in any kind of like really positive experience, unless it's more of a contrast of like, you know, that makes me appreciate all the good in future stuff, I guess. But for me to write that, it was such a personal thing and it was very difficult to kind of open up and to kind of make myself vulnerable, put myself out there uh, doing that. But I just felt like um, it would be something that a lot of people can hopefully relate to, whether it's going to be the the negative people who might encourage you to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Or just in the fact that we all have those those moments of failure. Like there are so many times where I could have given up and I could have gone and done something else. And I still wonder about that. Like what the hell would I be doing if I didn't choose the path that I made? And this applies to anything. I don't think that this is specifically going to be like, well, you got to be in 3D to, you know, for this to click. Um, I think it's just one of those things that if you go after something that for a lot of people feels unattainable, out of reach, or people are going to tell you like, you can't do that. No one can do that. It's up to you whether to listen to that or, you know, to, to allow that to feed in, into you and influence you and make you feel like, you know, I should give up because that's the kind of stuff that's going to be whispering in your ear when you're, you're down in the dumps and really kind of doubting yourself. And that's why I feel it's so important, like I said, to surround yourself with the people who are going to pull you up and who are going to help you and, you know, making those connections, networking, all these things are so critical. And the last thing I mention is, you know, what I, I do honestly feel like has been how I kind of go after all my goals is I work backwards. You know, I figure out what my goal is and I figure out all the, the weaknesses I might have, like the things that I need to work on. And I figure out all those other goals that I need to get to get to the big one. You know, by breaking them down smaller and smaller, they actually then become, you know, a recipe like footsteps. You can actually do this step by step. You will get to that big goal on the mountain, you know, I'm going to get a deeper metaphor, <laughs> but that's the sort of thing that anything that's unattainable, you know, for me back then being a little kid before the internet, anything else to say, I want to go and do all this stuff. I would have all that. I have people saying you're crazy and that's, you know, not possible at all. And suddenly, you know, by 18, I was getting offers at the, the biggest places that I had ever dreamed to go to. You know, I might've been able to get the visa stuff, but that's why episode 54 and 52 would have been really great timing for me with all the visa stuff back then. Um, but it was just a matter of having that persistence. And yeah, so anyway, I hope this uh, benefits some of you, maybe not. And like I said, you know, um, this is like the first time I've ever really done an episode like this. And, you know, I would love feedback and it's more just to see whether this is something that does resonate with you and also whether or not you found it to be really annoying me reading. Um, I definitely got really tongue tied and I might actually put a few bloopers at the end of this just because uh, I was losing my mind a bit uh, towards the end. But uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your feedback. And again, thanks for listening. Uh, I really hope some of you out there might uh, connect with this. Next episode, I'm going to go back into interview mode. So I've got some really amazing interviews with some really amazing people that I've been selfishly putting off because I wanted December to be all about really pushing your career, really uh, giving you guys some tools to, to do some cool stuff. And so like Ash Thorpe is a really cool one. I want to put his out because Ash has worked on, God, everything from Planet of the Apes to the new James Bond Spectre, Spider-Man 3, Call of Duty, Mission Impossible 5, Total Recall, 
Ender's Game, Prometheus, X-Men, Ant-Man, more Call of Duty, Iron Man 3, Robocop. I'm just going down his website at this point, but yeah, he's sick. 300, uh, yeah, everything. Thor, Sherlock Holmes, Lord of the Rings. Uh, crazy, crazy guy. So yeah, Ash is just an insightful guy, and the episode is great. As soon as I gave up on trying to go with the content that I wanted to talk about and just let it go, and um, yeah, I, I love talking with Ash. He's an amazing guy. Uh, I also have um, Call of Duty, which I've been promising for a while. Blizzard, I'm interviewing some of the guys in the cinematics department. Uh, God, Microsoft, 343, so many really awesome ones coming up. Anyway, so I'll leave it there. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for listening. This is the week of the mentorship as well, so I'm going to be opening it up for a week for registration if you want in. Uh, I've got some cool video content that I'm putting up right now. Uh, it's eight hours of free training and uh, sign up to that. And I'm basically going to be emailing everyone who's interested in that training about the uh, the links to the mentorship because I'm not really going to announce it publicly. Um, so because, yeah, it just fills up way too quick. So this will be more for people who, who are really interested, you know, dive in and get in before it closes. I've already had enough people being like, dude, I missed out last time. Please let me in ahead of everyone this time so I don't miss out. So yeah, it's going to go quick. I'll leave it there. And again, to get that, just go to www.almckay.com slash 55 for the show notes. But if you want to get to the video link or to register for the mentorship, then just go to www.almckay.com slash 55 download. And that will give you access to the videos. But more importantly, I'll mention everyone there about the mentorship. If that's something you want to do, work with me directly for a year and I'll mentor you, push you and uh, hopefully get to work with you one day. I'm going to end this episode with a couple of bloopers just uh, because I'm so tongue tied from reading uh, this long article. So that's it. I hope you're enjoying the new year and I'll see you soon. My work as I was hiring that everything they could pick a and I blah, 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 blah. I still remember my first day walking up the stairs into the main hall. The odd soap, soapy, smoky, <sighs> smoke, smoke, blah. <laughs>